Well, good morning, City Church. And a very warm welcome to you too, if you're tuning in later on on a Sunday, if you're watching from another church family somewhere else. And we're really glad you're with us, and we're really glad we can listen to God's Word together. We're reading from Psalm 90. If you have a Bible, do keep that open in front of you, and I'm going to read for us Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They're like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years, or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow. For they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendour to their children. May the favour of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. But Father God, these are not easy words. They are hard to hear hard for us to internalise and process. But we know that you only speak to us what is good, what is true. You speak to us out of love. And so help us please to submit to your words, help us to listen, to think about them rightly, and to know how we might live in these days. Please show us Jesus in your word. In his name we pray. Amen. I'm grateful to one of our other pastors, Neil, who pointed out to me an article written last week by a journalist uh, who's not a Christian, called George Monbiot. And George was writing about our current um, ex experience of coronavirus and what that's doing in our society. And he said this, We've been living in a bubble, a bubble of false comfort and denial. In the rich nations we've begun to believe we've transcended the material world. The wealth we've accumulated, often at the expense of others, has shielded us from reality. Living behind screens, passing between capsules, our houses, offices and cars and shopping malls. We persuaded ourselves that contingency had retreated. That we'd reached the point all civilizations seek, insulation from natural hazards. Now the membrane is ruptured and we find ourselves naked and outraged as the biology we appear to have banished storms through our lives. Well that's George Monbiot's assessment of how we're feeling right now as a nation and a world. And for most of us, I guess we, we feel some of that, we get some of that as we look out at infection rates in Italy and we're told that we're maybe two weeks behind that as we see our Prime Minister and then the Health Secretary of all people come down with the virus. Every time we go out feeling, am I, am I safe? Is this safe? Am I putting myself at risk? Am I putting other people at risk by doing this? How long is this going to go on for? Is this just now the new normal? Well, this psalm is written for a time like this. It's written for a time where you're in hardship and suffering. And it says to God, this is hard. We're weak. We're aware of our vulnerability, our weakness, like never before. Won't you do something? If you look above verse 1, you might see something like a prayer of Moses, a man of God. I think we're meant to think of Moses in the wilderness, leading the people of Israel for 40 years. 40 years of hardship, 40 years of wandering in the desert, 40 years until a whole generation died off. Now for us, it's day six of lockdown, it's not quite the same. But COVID-19 has brought an unprecedented awareness of our mortality, of our brevity, of our vulnerability. And it's important that's not the only thing we ever talk about now as Christians. There are lots of things we must and can talk about. 
But I think at this early stage, it's important that we understand as a church how to think about this. Firstly, what's going on? Someone said to me recently, I feel like coronavirus is in a different box from God. I don't know how to put the two together, my knowledge of God and what I see in the world of this virus and what's going on. We believe in a God who's good and a God who's powerful. So what's going on? How do we think about it? Secondly, how should we respond to it? How do we live as Christians in a time like this? What do we do with that knowledge of what's going on? We're going to walk through the psalm and we're going to see what Moses says about how to understand this moment in time and about how we should respond to it. So firstly, that question, what's going on? The psalm opens talking not about us, not about our situation, but about God. Verse 1, Lord, you've been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now there's lots here, but I picked some of it in our daily Bible thought video on Friday. You'll find that on our YouTube channel. But the big thing here, Moses is saying God is eternal. You've been our dwelling place throughout all generations. He's saying God is eternal. He's permanent. In fact, he's more permanent than the mountains. Now for us, it doesn't get much more permanent than a mountain range. Civilizations come and go, but the mountains stay pretty much the same. I wonder if you've had that experience of meeting someone who knew you a long time ago and they say, oh, I remember when you were this high, or I remember when you were born. God says that to the mountains. So the Appalachian Mountains, maybe three and a half billion years old, God says, I remember when you were born. To God, they're toddlers. Think how changeable the world is. Think how much has changed since 10 days ago. How day to day you never quite know what's going to happen, how life is going to change the next day. God doesn't change. He outlasts infinity. He is eternal. But Moses quickly moves on. Because this is there to make a contrast. God is eternal, we're not. Verse 3, you turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. We're turning to dust. That's the reality of our lives. We get grey hair. We get less hair. We get little twinges in our body. Maybe our our leg starts playing up. Our, our, Our insides just don't work the way they used to. We're like a statue out in the open, being eroded, being weathered, turning back to dust, but much, much faster. And then we see God's perspective in verse 4, and it's even faster. Verse 4, a thousand years in your sight are like a day that's just gone by, like a watch in the night. So if you make it to 70, 70 years, you'll have lived 12 God minutes. It's not literal, it's just a picture, but it's saying that by God's time scale, our lives are so short. In verse 6, they're like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. Isn't that devastating? We're like grass, Moses says. Grass, not a tree, not a shrub, not even a pot plant. We're like grass. And this isn't a green, luxurious lawn. No, this is little wisps of grass that grow up between the stones of the desert. When there's a little bit of moisture, a little bit of dew, and a little bit of shelter, and then the sun comes round and withers it. Think of the most impressive person you ever knew. The strongest, the cleverest, the smartest, the most full of vigour and life. Moses says, we're like grass. That's our human predicament, our situation. We have desires for permanence and for security and eternity, but instead we're brief and we're fleeting. Now I know that this is hard. Especially right now, it's hard for some of us. Because we're anxious, we're worried about loved ones. This stuff's in our face all the time and it feels like we'd rather be thinking about anything else. Some of us have experienced recently of grief. And even if we haven't, we experience that fragility in a million different ways with our anxieties and our fears and our helplessness. But I do want to draw attention to how we feel about it. Because we're supposed to think, so our society says, In a world without God, human brevity, that's just the way it is. That's just the kind of thing that happens. In a world where it's just maths and physics and chemistry and biology, pandemics will happen. Life will be fleeting. That's just how it is. Just ten minutes ago, Heather, my wife, told me about um, a family member of one of our close friends who's just died. In society's story, that's all there is. All you can do is just accept your vulnerability. 
But no matter how many times we're told that, we can't accept it. No matter how many times we're told it's inevitable, we kick against it. No matter how many nature documentaries we watch, no matter how many times Dumbledore tells us that death is just the next great adventure, we encounter human brevity as something wrong, something alien, something unnatural and intruded into our world, something that shouldn't be that way. Do you notice even here, this psalm doesn't present this as something natural. In fact, it seems worse. Verse 3, Moses says, you turn people to dust, speaking to God. Verse 5, you sweep them away in the death, sleep of death. It's God doing this. And then you think, well, why? Why would God do something so hard, so alien, so unnatural? Why would he allow that? And in verses 7 to 10, we see the answer. Because of God's wrath. Verse 7, we're consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You've set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. And our instincts kick against this, I know that. But remember, Moses has got a unique perspective. God had rescued Israel unmistakably, blatantly, powerfully, and tended them and led them and blessed them and nurtured them and then led them to the edge of a new home and said, here it is, now just go in, it's yours. And they turned around and spat in his face and rebelled against him. And so for 40 years they wandered in the desert. We're told that 600,000 men and their families left Egypt. And that entire generation died out in the desert. So just the men, that's 40 funerals a day. They dug the desert until it became a cemetery. Imagine getting up every day and there's 40 new graves there. And every one you see, you know that's because we rebelled. That is because of God's wrath. Moses literally sees God's people being swallowed up, consumed. Now we have difficulty with this because we think wrath means to be morally deficient. We think it means the wrath of a toddler who's unable to control their emotions. Or the wrath of the Titans, something out of a Greek myth, smiting people with thunderbolts. It doesn't mean that. God's wrath is a settled, consistent, fair hatred of everything that's evil. It's not a cosmic tantrum. But it is terrible. If you should go back to Genesis 3, at the very start, where mankind rejects God. They reject everything that's true and beautiful and good, and they try and push God out of his world, and there are terrible consequences. God says to Adam, you are dust, and to dust you will return. And then he cursed the ground, the created world that had been so good. And in that moment, everything broke. Everything started unravelling. Everything began to die. And now in Romans 8, we see creation groans. Verse 10, our days may come to 70 years, or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. What Moses is saying here is that the reason that life is hard and short, the reason for this outbreak, for every pandemic, for every war, for every grief, for every ache, for every tear, is that this is a world under God's wrath. Not the personal, directed wrath that says, you did this and so this happens to you. But this world is a world that is broken, that bears God's wrath and have rebellion against him. God's wrath makes us fleeting. Well, I wonder how you feel about that. And there'll be a mix of responses. Most of us will be uneasy, and that's okay. Be honest about that. Maybe later on, go back to Genesis 3 and take a look and ask yourself, is, is that really what's happening? Get your head around that. I think that is the biblical picture of what's happening right now. Of, for all brokenness, for everything that's wrong in the world. But now our question is, well, how do we respond to that? And there are at least two responses we might be making. Firstly, denial. I don't like to think about this, so I'm not going to. As I was preparing this week, I was typing some notes into my phone and trying to write the word sin. Using predictive text, I could not get my phone to write the word sin. It would write win, or sun, or soon, or anything. I tried 20, 30 times. I could not get it. Getting the letters exactly on, it would not write the word. And right now, I would desperately talk about anything other than sin and wrath. We would think about anything other than those things. Maybe for you, you'd rather block this out. You'd rather distract yourself. You're getting annoyed at me and about what we're thinking about because you're tempted to fast forward and say, well, I don't need this. And we've seen plenty of that, plenty of denial from some of our world leaders. 
That's denial. What about the other option, despair, maybe? Facing up to this, but being overwhelmed by it. George Monbiot said, feeling naked and outraged, unable to see a way out with no hope. Now, that will tend to be more hidden, that kind of reaction of despair, but I think we're seeing some of it. Moses doesn't do denial, and he doesn't do despair. He says something that might surprise you. Verse 12, he says, Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Number your days. Moses says those things that you want to block out, those things you think are negative and you don't want to have them in your mind, are the very things you need to remember if you're going to live well. If we go back to George Monbiot at the beginning, who said, we thought we transcended the material world and now we're naked and outraged. He goes on. The temptation, when this pandemic has passed, will be to find another bubble. We cannot afford to succumb to it. From now on, we should expose our minds to the painful realities we have denied for too long. He says the realities that are in our faces right now, of our weakness, our vulnerability, our mortality, we must think about them. We must remember them. If we don't, we're foolish. Now, he means, among other things, environmental catastrophe and read the article, overuse of antibiotics and those kinds of things. And they're, they're true. But how much more for bigger realities? There was an article on the BBC News website saying that professionals in the NHS are urging people to have conversations about end of life. Because that's the reality. We need to be talking about these things. And Moses says, number your days. You need to, to be wise. Don't ignore it. You need that knowledge so that you stop saying, I'll start family devotions next year. So you stop saying, I'll talk to that loved one about the gospel tomorrow. So you stop saying, well, I'll take prayer seriously just as soon as I'm out of isolation. You say, no, no, when you number your days, I start now. But it's not just about recognising mortality. There's more here. It means, I think, to reconfigure your whole view of reality. God's eternity, our brevity, and this being a world under wrath, to, to reconfigure how you see everything. And that's hard. As I said, the things we don't really like thinking about. But I want us to see this as a better story. Remember, our society says this is just the way it is. All you can do is accept your vulnerability. That's just how it is. But this story says, the Bible story says, God's story says it's not meant to be this way. The illnesses and viruses and self-isolation and mortality, these are not natural things. Death isn't the next great adventure. Our horror in the face of these things is because we're meant to be permanent. This story says it won't always be this way. There is a God, and he's not in a separate zone of reality. He cares about these things. He cares about the damage they're doing to his world, and one day he will undo them. There's more than just accepting your vulnerability. There is a happy ever after out there. If only we could get back into that. Moses says, teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. More than just facing mortality, it means resetting our view of reality, recognising that that story is the big story of us and our world, and that we're not the centre. COVID-19 isn't the centre. God is the centre. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So, you know, there's an opportunity here and now for this generation to become the most insightful, the wisest, the most purposeful, most in tune with reality generation that there's been for a long time. Will we take it? Could it be that among other things, this current crisis is God's way of teaching you to number your days, to reconfigure your view of reality? So that you stop ignoring these things, so that you let human brevity and a world under wrath shape how you act and how you live. I have to say, I don't act like these things are real much of the time, and I need to. If you're not a Christian, could it be that this is God's way of letting you know that he's there, that he's real and that you're not okay with him? Whoever you are, what are you going to do with this? Are you going to ignore it, pretend you haven't heard it, reject it, run away from it, deny it? Moses say, do any of, says, do any of those things, and you'll be a fool. That's the first response, number your days. Now the second response, to seek permanence and gladness in God. Because here the psalm takes a turn. 
Moses looks forward to the end of the story, but then you realise it's not the end, but it's the beginning of something so much better and more wonderful as our brevity is swallowed up in permanence and gladness. Verse 13. Relent, Lord. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you've afflicted us, for as many years as we've seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendour to their children. In the desert, still there, among the dust, among the graves, Moses has a hunch about God. He has a hunch that because of who God is, human brevity is not the last word. That despite being frail and fleeting, we can have a future. And so he prays this wonderful series of requests that sum up in a prayer, change the story. Won't you change what's going on here? Look at what he says and how big and bold these things are. Verse 13, he prays, relent, return. God says, return to dust. Moses says, return to us. He's got this hunch that one day his experience of God will change and there won't be any more trouble but mercy and compassion. He prays, verse 14, satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love. It's like Moses has been in the dark in the night time, but he knows there's a new morning coming, a beautiful sunrise and instead of being terrified by God's anger, he'll be satisfied by God's love. Verse 15, he prays, make us glad. Make us glad for as many days as you've afflicted us. Turn the tables. You've given us trouble, now give us good. He thinks one day God is going to deal with his people's sin and live among them in a way that doesn't mean death, in a way that doesn't mean wrath, but means life and means joy. And he looks forward and he prays that God would change the story from frailty and wrath to permanence and gladness. Now these are big requests, aren't they? They're bold. Remember what Moses has just said. He's just said, I'm grass. I'm dust. I'm nothing. I'm a shadow. I'm here one day and gone the next. So where does he get the boldness to pray like this? Where does he get the confidence to pray, make this grass everlasting? Well, as Christians, we read this and we see Jesus. Jesus, who was so far above us, so holy and separate and different, who came into the world as one of us. The eternal Son of God became brief. The unchanging one. In, in him was whole, all of history. Everything was contained in him. And yet somehow he entered history to join us. And he lived not 70 years but 30, and the best of them were but trouble and sorrow. And he finished his years with a cry of desolation. And on the cross he died to take that personal, directed wrath of God that was meant for me, meant for you, for our failure to be who we should be. And because he took our wrath, we get his love. Because he took our vulnerability, we get his security. Because he took our brevity, we become everlasting. The fear of frailty is gone. The fear of death is gone. Death is dead, like the Apostle Paul wrote in the New Testament. Where, O grave, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? There's nothing left to fear. And we get a future so much bigger and better than just balancing out good with bad. So much better than just making us glad for as many days as we've seen trouble. A future where everything is remade. Where the ravages of sin are undone. Where everything sad is made untrue. Where there's no more wrath. Where there's no more groaning. Where creation sings. And God himself lives with us and the finger of Jesus wipes away every tear from every eye. Where trouble isn't just cancelled but swallowed up in an ocean of blessing. Moses prays, change the story. The story will change. Some of us need to remember that. Some of us need to recognise again what Jesus did for us, what he achieved on our behalf. And to speak the gospel again to our fears and our anxieties. For some, maybe this is the first time you've heard this. Maybe you need to change your mind about yourself. The Bible uses the word repent. And it means to change your mind about yourself, about the world, about God, about what your life is about, what you're living for. To change the direction of your life and accept what Jesus has done for, your, for you. If that's you, if you know you need to do that, then get in touch with us. Through our Facebook, if you have a comment on the YouTube, however it is, we'd love to help you on that journey. Our brevity isn't the final word. 
We don't just accept our vulnerability. We can seek permanence and gladness in God. But there's one more verse I want us to look at. Because as Christians, one of the dangers is you hear this and you go, well, that's great, I'm safe. Phew, now I can just relax, I can just hunker down, keep safe until all this blows over and then I'll get on with serving God. Then I'll carry on with the things I'm meant to be doing. Once my frailty and my brevity isn't being dangled in my face quite so much. And you know I'm describing myself. Every day I wake up and my instinct is to retreat. Not to serve God, but to make myself safe, to huddle in. And I'm guessing you're like me as well. Look at the last thing Moses prays. He prays it while he's still in the wilderness. He prays it while he's still waking up every morning and seeing the new graves. While he's still vulnerable and brief. He says, verse 17, May the favour of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. The incredible thing is that we can do things that last in a world that's brief. As frail and fleeting people, mindful of our mortality and living in a world under wrath, we can pray, take what I do today, the little that I do, take my words, my actions, my hands, my feet, my video calls, the little I'm able to achieve in this fleeting short day and establish it. Make it permanent. Make it count. Make it eternal. Use it for something that lasts. And in Jesus we can have confidence that God will answer that prayer. Maybe the best film ever, Gladiator. And one of the key lines in it is Maximus saying, what we do in life echoes in eternity. When you make God your dwelling place, when you number your days every day, when you look for permanence and gladness in him, you can do things even in isolation, even in lockdown, that ripple out beyond your house, beyond your street, beyond your lifetime, and last forever. Because of Jesus, we can do things that last. The mission of God's people hasn't changed. The situation has. It's changed hugely. But our job to take the gospel into every conversation, every workplace, every family, every video chat, every society, every nation, to take God's grace out with us, that hasn't changed. We just have a new set of opportunities to show the enduring love of God in a fleeting world. So as we finish, let me ask, what will that look like for you this week? What difference will it make to you to understand the story that we're living in? To know what's going on? To know how you can respond to it? What difference will it make to number your days? What do you need to do now instead of putting it off till later? How can you remind yourself? How can you remind other people that your vulnerability and your brevity has been swallowed up in permanence and gladness? How can you speak the gospel to your fears and your anxieties? And as long as this current crisis lasts, what are the new opportunities you are being given to do what lasts? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for showing us the big realities, the story of our world. These things are hard, but we need them, and you tell us them because you love us dearly. Lord, we love you. Thank you that Jesus shared our brevity to give us his permanence. Thank you that we're safe. Now, Lord, establish the work of our hands for us. May we do in the coming days more than we can ask or imagine, because of your power at work within us, in our fleeting days, may we do things that echo in eternity. And we pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.